hear like comments when I walk out. It's always so funny. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. For the second time in recent days, a California community has been devastated by a mass shooting and families are mourning loved ones lost to a senseless act of gun violence. As some of the victims' families have said, we are starting Lunar New Year broken. To read their stories is indeed heartbreaking. Stories like the 65-year-old who went to the dance studio in Monterey Park on weekends because it's what she loved to do. And tragically, her family said that Saturday was her last dance. We've read moving tributes for the former dance student who helped manage the studio from his fellow dancers and his teachers. A grandmother whose family described how hard she worked to give back to her community and care for her loved ones died after being taken to the hospital in critical condition. We have mourned lives lost in mass shootings after mass shootings. The flags at the White House were already at half mast in honor of those murdered in Monterey Park when we learned of the shooting in Half Moon Bay. President Biden, like most Americans, believes that this is an urgent issue that too many of our neighbors, colleagues, kids are losing their lives to gun violence. Over the last two decades, more school-age children have died from guns than on-duty police officer and active duty military combined. And we know what the policy solutions are. We know how we can address this. In fact, last night, Senator Feinstein, along, alongside Senators Murphy, Blumenthal, and others, reintroduced a federal assault weapons, weapons and high-capacity magazine ban and legislation that would raise the minimum purchase age for assault weapons to 21. The last time we had an assault weapons ban on the books, thanks to the President and Senator Feinstein's leadership, mass shootings actually went down. After Republicans let it expire, mass shootings tripled, and that's just a fact. As you all know, President Biden has taken historic executive action to reduce gun violence, and last summer he signed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the first significant piece of gun safety legislation in nearly 30 years. But he, but he continues to believe, and these tragic events continue to show us, there is more to be done to keep our homes, schools, and communities safe. The President and the First Lady are thinking of those killed and injured in these latest shootings across America, but more importantly, he's urging both chambers of Congress to act quickly and deliver this assault, bans, uh, assault weapons ban to his desk and take additional action to keep American communities, schools, workplace, and homes safe. I also wanted to share exciting news about President economic plan continuing to create uh, results for Americans across the country. Today we learned 38 states are now at, our, at or below 4% uh, unemployment, and states from Pennsylvania to South Dakota to Alaska have record low unemployment. We also know a record 10.7 million jobs were created in the last two years. Annual inflation has fallen over the last six months. The economic, uh, the economy grew at 3.2 percent in the most recent GDP report, and a record 10.5 million small businesses applications were filed since the president took office. And we're continuing to lower health care costs for Americans. A new report shows that if Inflation Reduction Act's insulin cap were implemented in 2020, 1.5 million senators across the country could have saved an average of $500 per year on insulin. The Inflation Reduction Act's health provisions, including Permanent Affordable Care Act subsidies and Medicare negotiations uh, down, uh, Medicare negotiating down certain prescription drugs, mean more money in Americans' pockets and more breathing room for American families. As the President said in a statement this morning, and I quote, Americans are seeing a strong econ economy where they live. 
They are seeing their neighbors back to work with higher wages, even, even accounting for inflation. They're seeing prices down at their pharmacies. They are, uh, they are seeing new businesses opening uh, with, the most, with most Americans applying to start small businesses at any time on record, end quote. And finally, I wanted to say uh, hello and welcome to the Park School of Baltimore students. They are lined up to my left here who are here for, uh, for their, their career, uh, career exploration day. And welcome, uh, welcome students. I had an opportunity to meet all of you. Very impressive. And I know high school could be a lot of fun, but also very hard. Just stay focused, keep your passion, and uh, you'll get there. Uh, so good to see you all. With that, Amr, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, so I w first, I just wanted to ask, is there any uh, reaction uh, to Vice President Pence's announcement of finding classified docs uh, in his possession? Um, and then more broadly, most of the rules surrounding classification are created and can be amended by executive order. Does the president believe the system must be reformed? So first, uh, on your first question, look, I'm not going to comment on any ongoing uh, criminal investigation or any investigation. As you all know, the Department of Justice uh, is uh, independent, and we will not politically interfere. We've been very, very clear about that under this president. The president has been very clear since his campaign uh, uh, promises, and so I'm just going to refer you to the Department of Justice. On your second question, I, I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. Can I ask one on Ukraine? Sure. Um, is the administration ready to give Abrams to Ukraine in order? Uh, I guess one, are they, is, is the administration ready to give the Abrams? And two, um, if you are, is there, has it been connected with Germany also giving leopards? So I'm going to say we are in constant communications uh, with Ukraine and other allies and partners as it relates uh, to what Ukraine needs uh, in the battlefield. Uh, but I don't have any preview, anything to preview here, any announcements to make at this time of any new types of uh, security assistance uh, to preview for you today. Um, following up from yesterday, uh, has the president invited the Justice Department to search his Rehoboth Beach house? Again, I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office, who have been uh, regularly in touch with all of you, answering these questions uh, about uh, about this, this legal legal ongoing matter. I just don't have anything to share. And a couple of follow-ups on the Pence uh, issue. Does the White House believe that the Justice Department should appoint a special counsel to investigate former Vice President Pence's handling of classified documents? That's for the Department of Justice to decide. And, and now that we're seeing the two most recent vice presidents discover classified documents in their private homes. Does this suggest that there's a larger problem within the government where classified documents are not where they're supposed to be? Do a lot of people have documents outside of where they're properly supposed to be stored? I'm not going to comment from, from here on that. I would refer you to the White House Counsel and any, anything related to classified documents from here. Green. On the issue of gun control, you spoke about the President's commitment to an assault weapons ban and his view that there is more that can be done. How does, how do, I should say, the limitations in Congress, i.e. with the votes that you have or don't have in Congress, impact that view? And what, can you be more specific about what he thinks can be done given the votes that he has now? So I just want to remind folks that this is a president who has made gun violence and dealing with gun violence his, uh, his career. And he's actually been very, very instrumental in pushing, uh, pushing forward uh, these types of gun reforms that we have seen, whether it is uh, uh, what we saw with the assault weapons ban 30 years ago that he, he helped uh, get done with Senator Feinstein, uh, or signing the bipartisan uh, piece of legislation that he signed into law just mo uh, months ago. Uh, that was, again, the most significant piece of, uh, uh, piece of uh, legislation that dealt with gun violence. And uh, let's not forget, he has made this a priority for him, for him uh, in his presidency since day one with historic executive action. So uh, I say all of this to say is this is a priority for the president. When folks thought we wouldn't be able to get a bipartisan deal uh, done on dealing with gun violence, that was able to, uh, that was, uh, that was able to get done with, because of the president's leadership on this, because of the president's focus on this. Uh, look, we are always looking for, uh, his team is always looking for uh, ways to, re to, to do, to continue with gun, uh, to do executive actions to deal with uh, reducing gun violence. Uh, but what we believe uh, is that Congress needs to act. They need to put forth legislation uh, that can go into law and deal with this issue. We cannot continue to see communities uh, be devastated by this. 
as a parent, we should not be waking up every morning uh, worried that our child or our kids may have to deal with gun violence. If you're going to the grocery store, you should not have to worry about going to the grocery store and potentially having to deal with gun violence or going to the movies, watching a movie with your partner or with your kids and eating popcorn and wait and potentially having to worry about gun violence. And so the president has been very clear, and this is not just the last two years, this has been the many decades uh, of his career. So we're gonna have to continue to have those conversations with Congress, we're gonna continue to call on Congress to take action. On a separate topic, uh, U.S. officials have determined that Chinese companies have been sending non-lethal assistance to Russia for Ukraine. Um, what is the United States saying to the Chinese government about this? So we're closely monitoring the situation as we have been since the war started. Uh, we will continue uh, to communicate to China the implications of providing uh, material support to Russia's war against Ukraine. We uh, we have talked about this many times that uh, we uh, we will you know be very clear what it means to support uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine. And as I've said many times, as my colleagues from NSC has said many times, we'll continue to support Ukraine and the Ukrainian people as long as needed. So what are those implications? I'm not going to get into. Uh, diplomatic or private conversations from here. I'm just going to let you know that we've been monitoring the situation and we've been very clear with with, uh, with the Chinese government on this. Yeah. Thanks, Karine. You talk about how gun violence has been a priority for this administration. It's been a priority for the president over his entire career. How does he feel in moments like last night? Is it frustration? Is it helplessness? It personally, how does he deal with this continuing to be a major problem in the country? You know, Phil, I would say that you've seen him uh, out there, sadly, uh, with many of these uh, tragedies, uh, mourning with the families, uh, offering his support to families, and uh, it is, uh, it continues, to, you'll, you continue to, what you see from him is certainly how he feels when he sees these types of uh, travesties. Uh, you saw that in Uvalde, sadly, when we saw kids were gunned down, where families had to identify, uh, the, the way they were identify their own children was through DNA. That's how horrible that situation was. You saw him in Buffalo, New York, uh, meeting with the 10 members, uh, the 10 victims who were killed, and him meeting with those families and dealing uh, with their heartache. And so this is a president that feels, right, that is able to feel what people are going through uh, because he knows what loss means to families. Uh, so, yeah, you know, he wants to continue to fight. He wants to continue to speak out against this. Uh, you've seen his statements over the last several days, sadly, uh, and what we have seen with gun violence across the country. Uh, and so you'll continue to see that, and he will continue to speak about this in a way uh, that lifts up the families who are, who are dealing with this loss, very devastating loss, and continue to call on Congress to take action. And one more shot on the uh, on the Pence documents. Is there any sense inside the White House that this perhaps shifts the political or public perception dynamics of uh, what the president has been facing over the course of the last several weeks? I'm just not going to comment from here. Got yeah, Joey. Yeah. yeah sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I thought you were there yesterday, yeah, Joey. No, I, I but it was Michael. I apologize, well, Michael. No. <laughs> um, it, do you have any update on whether the president uh, plans to visit California? I know you were asked yesterday, but since then, there's, as we noted, there was a second uh, mass shooting there. So I, no, no plans at this time to preview about a president, uh, presidential travel to California. Uh, you saw his statement. I just kind of read part of his statement. Uh, his, heart, his heart goes out uh, to the families, uh, to the victims of the families, uh, and, um, and we will continue to fight. Uh, to, to make sure we deal with this issue, we deal with gun violence. We started with the executive actions, the historic executive actions that the president uh, was able to do the first two years of his administration. Uh, we were able, again, as I mentioned, uh, sign a bipartisan uh, piece of legislation uh, to deal with gun violence, but we need to do more. We need to do a lot more, and so the president's going to continue to call for that. I don't have anything to preview about our trip. Yeah, and you were kind of alluded to this, or asked a little bit about this, but we, what is the strategy now to, to pass uh, uh, the, we the assault weapons ban that, that uh, uh, Feinstein introduced. I mean, you're, you're talking, of course, about a Republican-led House now. Uh, and so how, I mean, you know, what, what can the White House do to actually overcome those 
those numbers there. Yeah, and one thing I just want to go back to on California, the president has been in touch with local and state leaders, and his, his team continues to offer support uh, to uh, the local government and uh, clearly um, uh, Governor Newsom's team uh, in any way that we can to be helpful to what they're dealing with today, uh, this week, I should say. Uh, look, it, it is, you know, it, it is a priority for the president. It really is. That's why he's taking executive actions. Uh, that's why his team has worked with Congress uh, on this bipartisan legislation that was passed several months ago, and he'll continue to do that. And, you know, I think if you all remember, and many of you reported this, that, that how difficult it was going to be for the president to get any bipartisanship the first uh, two years of his administration, and he was able to get historic pieces of legislation done. And so the president says this all the time. He is an, he's, he's uh, optimistic. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I think optimism in the, is very important to this president. But at the same time, he's going to continue uh, to ask Congress to act, and, uh, and he's going to continue to see what other executive actions can be taken from here. But at the end of the day, we need Congress to act. We need legislation that can be signed into law to deal with a matter that is really tearing apart communities. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Green. Um, was the White House aware before this afternoon that classified documents had been found at Vice President Pence's residence as well. I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. And does the White House believe that other former high office holders should now go back and check their personal residences out of an abundance of caution to make sure that they're not holding on to classified documents as well? That's not something I can comment from here. Uh, I don't even, we don't, I don't even know the, uh, uh, you know, the, the reasoning of what the news that we heard about Pence. So I'm just not going to comment from here. Uh, I'm not going to comment on any other uh, former elected official, current elected official. With this particular case, I refer to the Department of Justice. Anything uh, that relates to this White House, I would refer to the White House Counsel's Office. Um, and then on the Abrams tank, last week at the podium, John Kirby said that the Abrams is expensive to maintain, to operate, to fuel, and it requires a lot of training. Does this White House still have those same concerns when it comes to providing tanks to the Ukrainians? So as my DOD uh, colleagues have said uh, very recently that, uh, again, nothing to preview from here, uh, certainly uh, don't have anything to share, but they never ruled out tanks. Uh, just want to make that very clear. I think what my colleagues at the DOD have said uh, in the past, well, very recently, is that there's there were always challenges uh, with uh, tanks, but not going to preview anything. I think I would refer you to the DOD comments on this. Again, they've always been challenges. It's never been taken off the table. Uh, but as I just mentioned, I don't have anything to those preview. Are the, those are the challenges. What are the benefits? to the potential of I mean, we've change. already, we've always said, again, nothing to preview, want to be very clear here. Uh, we've always said that we are in constant communication with Ukraine as they're, uh, as they're trying to figure out what they need on the battlefield. And, uh, and we are always looking for ways uh, to offer security, uh, security assistance uh, for them. And so, again, not going to get ahead of any, uh, any uh, potential announcement. I don't have anything for you to preview, for, to preview, but we're always in constant communication with Ukraine and what it is that they need uh, for their success, what it is that they need uh, to really battle the aggression that we have seen uh, from, uh, from Russia this almost past year. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Germany's ruling party just confirmed that they've decided to send leopard tanks to Ukraine. Uh, do you have any comment on that? And uh, is that linked to, in any way, uh, reversal of this consideration of the U.S. Uh, government sending Abrams? To Ukraine as well. So we have said this before. We believe it's up to each individual uh, country. Uh, it is uh, uh, their own sovereign uh, sovereign decisions on what they provide for Ukraine. We've been very clear about that, uh, and uh, we always appreciate uh, what our allies, our partners, are doing uh, to make sure that Ukraine is able to defend itself. I'm not going to go beyond that. Uh, again, don't have anything to preview from here. Switching topics on uh, on Ticketmaster, there was a uh, hearing in the Senate today. Given the White House's concern about uh, monopoly power, uh, you know, does the White House believe the Live Nation uh, Ticketmaster merger should be unwound? Uh, given what we've heard today from senators expressing that concern as well. Are you a Swifty? Is that what it's called? I don't I'm know. <laughs> <laughs> Things that you learn. Um, so. 
Well, President Biden is a strong proponent of increasing competition in our economy. Uh, as he said last year when he signed the landmark executive order on competition, and I'll quote, the heart of American capitalism is a simple idea, open and fair competition, but capitalism without competition isn't capitalism, it's exploitation. So uh, I'll say one more thing about the executive order. It establishes a whole of government effort to promote competition in the American economy because we know the lack of competition leads to higher prices and, and uh, worse service. So uh, again, he, you know, capitalism without competition isn't capitalism, it's exploitation. And that's why he's made, uh, he's really uh, made an effort with his executive actions uh, to deal with something that truly matters to the American people. Same and the Swifties, <laughs> Does the same concern apply to Google, which is facing a new DOJ action today? Uh, look, I'm, I'm not gonna get into DOJ action or what DOJ is potentially uh, 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 any legal matters that they potentially are taking. What I will say is more broadly is how the president is a proponent for increasing competition in our economy, and he has shown that through his actions. Uh, on gun violence, you've mentioned the potential for further executive action. Is there an active review underway of other potential executive actions? Where Where is this being worked on within the administration? So don't have anything to uh, to share on any active review. What I can say is that the president has asked his team to do all they can uh, through executive action to reduce gun violence. Uh, we've seen him uh, make his historic progress via, via executive action to deal with this dangerous uh, uh, violence that we're seeing, gun violence specifically that we're seeing across the country in dangerous hands. Uh, so we'll continue to pursue executive actions to reduce gun violence. Don't have anything right now to share or preview or list out what is it that we're exactly looking at, but his team is always looking at ways to improve, uh, to, to deal with an issue, again, that is devastating communities across the country. Uh, but I, I also want to be very, very clear here, uh, in order to deal with this, we need Congress uh, to act, and that's uh, the way that we're really uh, going to be able uh, to deal with a, a matter that is, again, devastating communities, uh, devastating families across the country. On documents, I realize you don't want to comment on existing issues, but there is clearly an ongoing issue uh, across administrations with handling of classified materials. Um, perhaps this isn't the right time for this White House to lead a review of U.S. policy on classified materials, but is that something that the the White House is considering, is there someone who would be the right person to lead a review of the current um, challenges that are obviously tripping up people from all parties? Okay. Understand the question, and I know it's going to come in many different ways, but I'm going to refer you to the White House Counsel's Office, who would be the best, uh, they would be the best folks to, to, to talk through about that. Thank you, Karine. I want to follow up on your brain. Um, the administration has been uh, relatively successful in forming alliances not just in Europe, but in Asia as well, Australia, New Zealand, and um, uh, Japan, uh, against Russia, of course, and imposing economic sanctions. But is the White House um, satisfied with the military assistance that these countries are giving? I know you're going to say it's a sovereign state and they can decide for themselves, but at this point, as we're approaching the one-year anniversary, are you satisfied? with what you ask from alliances to give to Ukraine militarily? I mean, look, we've always been very appreciative of our allies and partners uh, in their efforts to help Ukraine and what they have decided their security assistance uh, is going to be uh, for Ukraine. And so we will continue to be appreciative. We will continue uh, to thank them. Uh, again, and you said it in your question to me, it is a sovereign decision. It is up to each individual country to decide. How are they uh, going to do their part in helping Ukraine uh, fight against Russia aggression? But you know, these are our allies, these are our partners, and uh, we will continue to work with them closely uh, to, uh, to make sure that uh, Ukrainians are able to, to fight this brutal war. Are you being called in these alliances? Say that last part. The alliances, are they still holding? Yeah. I, we, we believe that they are. I'm going to go, I'm going to come back down. Go ahead, Steve. Thanks. Uh, it being the White House's position for the last several weeks that the, the President's legal team did the right thing, is it the initial observation of the White House that the Pence legal team did the right thing? That's not for me to, to comment on from here. I would refer you to the Department of Justice. One of the things that the Pence team seems to have done in the last week is uh, make public disclosure of the circumstance. Uh, 
advise NARA, but also advise Congress, and now the public. Any reflections uh, among the communications of press staff here as to how the Pence team handled it versus how you can tell? Uh, Steve, I understand your question and I hear it. Uh, we've had we've answered your question in many different variations. I'm I'm just not don't have anything else to share from here. Uh, if you have any more specifics or details about this, uh, about the ongoing legal matter, I would refer you to the Department of Justice. Anything else, I would refer you to the White House Counsel's yeah, office. I'll for two months. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, did, uh, does the White House have a response to Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's surprise trip to Jordan today to meet with King Abdullah, and do you think it could help reduce tensions in the region? Uh, I have not seen those reports. I have not been able to talk to our National Security Council about it, uh, but uh, clearly we are, as you know, uh, Jake, Jake Sullivan just recently went uh, to Israel uh, to meet with his counterparts uh, to continue the, the very important relationship uh, we have with Israel, just don't have anything further. It, we normally don't comment on uh, on individual and countries meeting uh, and the agenda that they have with other countries, uh, but don't have anything specific to share on that. Can you say anything more about what's on the agenda today with uh, for the meeting at 3 o'clock with um Democratic leadership. So, as you know, the president is, is very much looking forward to meeting with the new Democratic leadership, uh, and uh, that is happening pretty soon, uh, less than, I don't even know, less than an hour. Um, and so he's going to host them in the Roosevelt Room. You're going to hear from him at the top. He'll have something uh, to share about his thoughts about the meeting. Uh, they'll cover a wide range of issues, especially how we can make even more economic progress on top of what our shared accomplishments have led to. Uh, the creation of over 10.7 million new jobs and 10 million small business uh, business starts, bringing down inflation and a record number of Americans enrolling in health care coverage. One of the main avenues for doing that is ramping up implementation of the legislation they accomplished together uh, over the past two years. When you think uh, of Infl Inflation Reduction Act, when you think about the continuing imp implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, that's what uh, one of the topics that certainly that will come up. And uh, look, the President has said this. He said this after the midterm elections. He said this many times. I've said this. He is look. He is. Uh, he is looking forward to uh, working with Republicans in good faith to continue the work uh, that he has been able to do the last two years, some in a bipartisan way, uh, to deliver for the American people. But look, he is also going to call out, as and we have said this before, continue to call out any uh, any dangerous extreme MAGA Republicans. He can do both. Uh, but like proposals to raise taxes uh, on the middle class or cut Medicare, cut Social Security, uh, as we've been hearing from uh, from national Republicans, or also, and let's not forget, the national ban, uh, a national abortion ban, or worsen inflation. Uh, and so those are the things that uh, the president is very focused on. And I think the most important thing that uh, I think you can take away from this is he wants to continue to deliver for the American people. He's, do he's willing to do that in a bipartisan way, but it has to be in good faith. Go ahead. Um, that was one of my questions about the preview. But one of the things I wonder is the president has received some Democratic uh, criticism about how he has handled uh, some of the things that he has said about the documents matter. Do you expect that he might address that uh, with the Democratic leaders? Because it's obviously got political implications for uh, just how he's perceived and, and perhaps some of his political strength going forward. Yeah, I kind of talked about this, Kelly, a little bit yesterday, and um, some some of those same criticism uh, um, from uh, from Democrats. They also said the president, they believe the president uh, did what he needed to do and uh, handled uh, has handled it uh, fully and in a co cooperative way. Uh, but look, I, you know, as it relates to the politics of this, as it relates to the American people, uh, and, you know, we'll continue to say this, it's up to the American people to decide. Uh, they, you know, they're smart. They know what's going on. Uh, they know what this president has been doing and delivering on. Uh, you know, we've talked about the midterms and what was supposed to be or what was predicted to be, and it didn't happen, right? When you think about the red, the, 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 the red wave that we had heard over and over again, and part of that why we didn't see that is because the president led with a message that resonated and connected with the American people. He led with what he has been able to do when it comes to the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, when it comes to uh, making sure that he, we're, he's doing the work to 
uh, lower cost at the gas pump, which he has been able to do. And so, look, we will uh, let the American people uh, see for themselves uh, what the President has been able to deliver the last two years. I'm just not going to get into, fur into any further uh, discussion about and politics. Specifically, right do you know if he has been briefed on the Pence matter? And has he had any outreach with former President Obama since some of the documents would have been from their joint administration? You know, uh, those two questions I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. Thanks, Green. After a special counsel was named, but before the FBI searched, President Biden went to his house in Wilmington. What was he doing in there? I would refer you to the White House Counsel. Office. So it was something relating to this case? I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. Okay. Do you think that this story was leaked by someone trying to bruise the president politically ahead of a re-election announcement? I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office as they've been the ones who've been uh, uh, closely involved. Okay. More basically, we know the president did it. Why did he do it? I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. In the president's own words, he admits to having information that wasn't his. Why did he smuggle it out? I will let the, 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 the statement of the president stand for itself. I'm just not going to go into a rabbit hole, down a rabbit hole with you on this. Why did he not tell and, you about uh, it? Yes, Chris, thanks. Uh, slight shift to topic. Haiti. Um, the UN envoy to Haiti has just been saying today that, that it's basically out of control and the gangs run. Well, they don't really run anything, but they're in charge. Um, can we expect any shift from the, you know, any maybe up tempo of the U.S. response to this, given not just the humanitarian side, but maybe the national security aspect for the U.S.? So, don't have anything new to share uh, on any um, new announcement or engagement. Uh, look, this is something that we have been monitoring very closely, um, and uh, we have done, uh, you know, everything that we can. Uh, to, uh, you know, in this time, uh, to help the Haitian people, to help in a way uh, that could really make a difference in the humanitarian uh, aid, as you have you just laid out. Uh, and, um, and I just don't have anything else to share be beyond uh, what you laid out. Uh, but this is uh, truly a, um, important to the president uh, and what's going on in Haiti. Uh, and you've heard us talk about it uh, in, you know, uh, uh, over the past several months, you heard the president talk about this at Knowles when he was in Mexico City, when he met with uh, the Canadian Prime Minister, when he met with the president of Mexico, was clearly on the agenda and a conversation that they had. We had a readout uh, on that specifically. It was brought up uh, in the um, in the press conference that they had. I just don't have anything further to share. Karin, since you don't have any answer on the classified I document, you seem a good fit for this job. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, my friend. Go ahead. Go ahead, my friend. Has, the, has any meeting been set between uh, the president and the speaker yet? I don't have a meeting uh, to announce from here with Speaker Mc McCarthy. Uh, I know that it is a, a we, we've commented on this. This is something that the president is certainly looking forward to. Uh, and look, he, he's willing and wants to work with the speaker in, in good faith and delivering in a bipartisan way for the American people. Don't have anything to preview at would this time. Before or after the State of the Union? This is something that he would, as you know, it's tradition, right, for uh, the president to meet with the new Congress uh, before the State of the Union. Just don't have anything to share at this time. On the meeting that will happen. Um, I, I know that when the president spoke about it, it was in the context of the deficit and debt, mm -hmm. having those conversations. Is that sort of what the engagement would be limited to, or, or would the president want to expand out the, you know, you talked a lot about gun violence or, or the border? So, look, there's going to be a range of issues that's going to be discussed. Uh, as you mentioned, when he was talking about the deficit, uh, he was talking about wanting to work in a bipartisan way to continue uh, to lower the, the, the uh, uh, the debt, right, which he has been able to do by $1.7 trillion in a historic record. He's always willing to have good faith conversation to deliver for the American people in that way. Uh, but when it comes to, look, when it comes to the the, uh, the debt limit, the debt ceiling, the president has been very clear. I have been very clear. You've heard from our economics team about that, how this should be done without conditions. That still stands. And we can't forget that, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, uh, the debt ceiling has been de dealt with 78 times since 1960, 49 times under a, president, a Republican president and 29 times with a Democratic president. Uh, and let's not also forget, I think this is something that people who need to understand, when you talk about uh, uh, the debt ceiling, you're talking about not 
more new spending. You're talking about what what Congress the what the the bill that Congress has racked up, right? This is this is their basic duty uh, to you know to deal with the debt ceiling. Uh, when the president walked in, uh, well, if you look at the debt ceiling right now, 90 percent of it was before the president uh, walked into office. So this is their duty. This is their duty to do this in a bipartisan way. That's what we're talking about. And when you're when Republicans are saying they're going to uh, they're, they want to cut Social Security, they want to cut Medicare, uh, they want to uh, cut uh, programs that Americans have paid into. That's going to hurt senior citizens. That's going to hurt our veterans. That's going to hurt ta taxpayers. And so that's what we're talking about. And so it, it is their basic duty to deal with this. Got Stephen. Oh, thank you, Corrine. Um, I have two questions. The first, uh, New York New York Congressman Nick Lalota is skipping tonight's presidential reception for new members of Congress in protest of White House coronavirus rules that require an attestation of vaccination and a negative test result. Uh, Lalota says the rules are arbitrary and unscientific and should be far behind us. Does the White House have a reaction to that? Um, so, haven't seen those that reporting or those comments from uh, the congressman. But I'll say this: uh, we have protections in place to protect staff and the president of the United States. COVID isn't over. Uh, we've been very clear about that. Hundreds of Americans are dying every day, and cases are increasing right now, uh, today. Uh, that's why we take common sense measures like COVID testing ahead of, of large indoor gatherings uh, at the White House. And so this is uh, an important uh, an important issue that's been important when we're talking about COVID and dealing with COVID and coming up with comprehensive uh, ways to make sure that people get vaccinated. Uh, that's something that the president dealt with from day one of his administration. If I could just follow up very briefly on that. Um, I'm curious if there was a reason that we still have uh, the vaccine attestation rule, especially considering the very highly transmissible Omicron mutations that can elude uh, most of the common vaccines. So what I can tell you, Stephen, is we listen to the experts and uh, we look at the data uh, and uh, we, you know, we pay very close attention to science uh, and just don't have anything to, do, to, to say beyond that. That is something uh, that uh, uh, our experts, uh, we take their advice when it comes to uh, things like that. My second question uh, is regarding a uh, comment from Senator Ted Cruz. Uh, he's calling for a search of President Biden's Senate records at the University of Delaware for potentially classified information. Uh, those records reportedly include about 1,850 boxes of documents as well as 415 gigabytes of electronic files. Uh, does President Biden have any objection to such a search? Uh, when it comes to uh, the documents and this ongoing legal matter, I refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. I, 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 would it, I just oh, like to re. I, <laughs> I'm just, so sorry. You I just said like you had two. You I just four. like to re-up the, the request of our colleagues in this room for someone to answer these questions from the podium. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Okay. You got? I'll, I'll come to you. Go ahead. Uh, Kareem, the Oversight Chair, he had a uh, Mr. Comey. He wrote, he wrote the head of the Secret Service, asking for the uh, visitor information from Wilmington. Now, I know you said there's no visitor logs, but do you have any objection, or does the White House have an objection, to the Secret Service providing any documents or communication about who is going in and out? Again, I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office on, on any anything that's related to um, uh, the investigation, uh, the oversight hearing that's happening. And then just at the top, in response to the Pence question, you said you weren't going to comment on any ongoing criminal or other investigations. There's, is there any reason to believe any of these are criminal? I, I'm just saying I'm just not going to. Uh, I'm just not going to comment on any type of investigation. Uh, the, the Department of Justice is independent, and we just don't comment on any any in, in, in investigations from here. Thank yes, uh, Karen. On gun violence, uh, it's very clear to everybody that gun is a problem in this country. I'm going to give you an example. In Africa, when we see news from the U.S., like a six-year-old boy bringing gun to school, and we see people going to the movie theater being killed by gun, and also seeing people in this country that have not seen war but are killed by gun, is extremely scared for us. And we have seen that this country is very developed. What do you think? is preventing the Congress to act when it comes to gun control? And what can more President Biden do to move on and do something to control the gun? And my question comes because I'm a mother. I have two daughters, and when they go to school, sometimes I'm afraid 
that maybe his little boy, a colleague from school will bring a gun, or even in <coughs> random place, we, we get shot. This is very, very scary, and this is a problem, and, and we, we saw recently people also dying by gun. What can president do more to move on and control the guns? And please, what do you think the Congress is waiting to act? So when it relates to the Congress, you have to ask Congress. You have to go over to, a con to Congress and meet with uh, congressional members and ask them that very question. Lay it out just the way that you laid it out to me. I think it's an important question for them to answer. Uh, but also, we saw last night Senator Feinstein, along with Senators Murphy and Blumenthal, reintroduce uh, the assault weapons ban, which we support. Uh, and we encourage for Congress to act on that, on that piece of legislation. Look, again, I would, refer, I would suggest you go talk to them about this. Look, you just laid out what I just said. Right? You just laid out about going to the movie theaters and being worried about gun violence. You just laid out about being a parent and worrying about your child going to school or going to the grocery store and worried about gun violence. That is something that we should not have to deal with. And this is something, again, if you look at the president's sen record as a senator, you look at his first two years as president, he's dealt with this issue. Uh, and, and he's going to continue to do what he can from here, use the tools of the federal government uh, to take action. He has taken historic executive actions, as I just laid out moments ago. But when it comes to really, truly dealing with this issue, we need legislation. We need legislation. We need Congress to act. So we are thankful and we are hopeful to see uh, what, what occurred uh, with, uh, with this legislation that was introduced, again, by Senators Feinstein, Blumenthal, and Murphy. And we're going to continue to encourage Congress to act. But I would, I would pose the question that you just asked me uh, to Congress. Okay. Just a follow up quick, still on gun violence. Uh, we have spoke, uh, like between me and some friends, that uh, in this country, and this, I'm, I'm making this point because, because we need to remind people that America is the only country on earth that people die by gun without even being on, in war. Because I'm giving this example because in Africa there is countries in, in war, but people doesn't even have access to gun. It's very hard because the government and everybody is very conscious that the guns can cause a lot of destruction. But in this country, it's very normal for everybody to have access to gun, and this needs to be controlled. But what can people like me, common people, can also, what can we do to help control gun in this country? Well, look, uh, what I can speak to, there are many ways that people can get involved uh, in, in dealing with the gun violence that we're seeing here. Uh, I'm not going to uh, make any suggestions, but there are ways that folks can go out there and, and, uh, and participate uh, in a way that's uh, healthy, in the way that actually helps uh, deal with a real issue. What I can speak to is uh, what the president has done. What I can speak to is what the president believes. What I can speak to is the president's record on this, which is you can see for yourself as a senator, this last two years uh, as president and the executive actions that he's taken. He signed a bipartisan piece of legislation, as I just mentioned moments ago, uh, to deal with, uh, in, in taking one step to deal with gun violence. Uh, and so, look, that's what I can speak to. That's what I, we can talk about very clearly. And we are going to continue to discuss and have the conversation and call on a Congress to act. All right, go ahead. Thanks, Green. Uh, we heard you talk about the statement that President Biden took out, uh, put out, but why haven't we heard the President address the American people on camera about these recent shootings? He's taken, which one? About these, the shoot, shootings that have happened recently. Yeah, I mean, he has, um, he's talked about it um, many times, as you know. Um, and I'm sure you'll hear from him uh, in the upcoming days to, uh, uh, to talk about what he has seen and how devastating the gun violence, especially this week, has been. Um, and look, you've seen him, as I mentioned, in Uvalde, when he was uh, comforting the parents uh, of um, the kids who were, who were murdered. Uh, you saw him in Buffalo uh, when he was, um, again, comforting families who saw their family member uh, murdered. And um, it's been too many, too many. And so you'll continue to hear from us. Uh, I think when the president puts out a statement, that is a very powerful, uh, uh, powerful action by, by the president. You all take it. You all repeat what the president has said. So I wouldn't, I would take that as a serious uh, uh, 
uh, a serious communication from the president, as you all already do. Um, and uh, he'll continue to speak out about it. And have you spoken with the president about the most recent uh, report that more documents were found at his home personally? No, no. I have not. Biden the Former Secretary, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, who in his new book in a tweet sent this afternoon has referred to Jamal Khashoggi as an activist and a part-time stringer. So I'm going to I'm going to let uh, uh, Mr. Pompeo speak for himself. Here's what I will say and what we uh, will say from the White House about this about this issue from the earliest days of this administration. We took the murder of Jamal Khashoggi very seriously. Uh, that included releasing intelligence community report on the murder, which was not done in the last uh, administration, uh, sanctioning a, a number of Saudi officials and entities, and instituting the so-called uh, Khashoggi ban. Again, I will let Mr. Pompeo speak for, for himself. Do you think Jamal Khashoggi, would you consider him an activist? I, I'm not going to get it. He's, I'm not going to get into describing uh, um, Jamal Khashoggi. I can tell you how we uh, acted and what we have done over the past two years, and uh, and be very clear on what the White House has taken, the actions that White House has taken. Okay. Thank you so much. Another Africa question for you today. With news that the UN ambassador is heading to the continent, and Janet Yellen is there right now. What messages are these two top cabinet officials trying to send to African countries broadly? How do you combat concerns and perceptions that the continent is yet again being used as a battlefield for a proxy war between East and West? And then also, how do these visits lay the groundwork for the President's promised visit to the continent? And any details on that would be awesome. <laughs> well, uh, to your last question first, um, uh, don't have anything to preview about the President's visit, a uh, potential visit to, South, uh, to, uh, to, to Africa. Uh, we have said that he is going to make a visit, just don't have anything to share at this, at this time. So our partnership in Africa is not about, uh, uh, about other nations. Uh, our partnership there. It's uh, it, as demonstrated by our commitments at the U.S. Uh, Africa Leaders Summit. The United States sees African countries as genuine partners uh, and wants to build relationship based on mutual respect. That's what you saw uh, at the summit, and that's what the president has been consistent on, and that's what we want to see. Our focus is on Africa and our efforts to strengthen these partnerships across a wide range of sectors spanning from businesses to health. Uh, to peace and security. Building on those efforts, we've had Secretary Blinken and Secretary Yellen travel to the region uh, very recently. And as you noted, we have uh, uh, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield's upcoming travel uh, to Ghana, Mozambique, and Kenya, and that's going to be from January 25th to the 29th. Uh, the ambassadors, uh, it, this is going to be the ambassador's third trip to the sub-Saharan uh, Africa. And, and since she took up her position at the U.S. Uh, ambassador to the United Nations, she's gone three times under this uh, current tenure that she's currently doing. And you will continue to see us uh, following through the president's commitment and to, step, and to step up our engagement across Africa this year and beyond. Uh, and um, look, this is a commitment. We saw it when we put the summit together with 49, 50 head, heads of states who are here, right here in D.C. Uh, and that was over three days, and the president participated in the summits. His team participated in the summit, and we talked about issues that really mattered uh, to the continent and issues that really mattered uh, to us as well. I'm not sure why those specific countries were chosen. You just mentioned uh, Kenya, Mozambique, and yep. Ghana. I would refer you to uh, the to the UN, to the ambassador's office. As I said, it's her third trip. Right, so she's gone two other times, uh, and so I would refer you to their specific strategy on why these three uh, countries. Okay, Courtney. Thank you. I wanted to ask if you have any information at this point about the release of the budget for next fiscal year. So, um, as you know, this the president is looking forward uh, to releasing his budget to the American people. Clearly, that's something that uh, is important uh, for this president to do. And uh, the OMB, his team at the OMB, is working very, very hard uh, in uh, in in getting that done and the timing. And uh, obviously, his, his budget for 2024. Uh, and uh, and don't have any don't have a time uh, for uh, for when this is going to to happen. Uh, but again, this is something that he wants to make sure that uh, uh, he uh, he wants to share with Congress and the American people, and it's a priority to him. It used to be at the beginning of February and when you entered the administration. I don't think you all have met that deadline yet um, or that time frame yet. 
um, does that have anything to do with when last year's appropriations were done? I mean, what's affecting why you wouldn't have a date yet? So, look, the um, the omnibus, the timing of the omnibus uh, late last year certainly has an impact uh, on the budget's timing, but certainly we'll be in touch with when we're ready uh, to share the President's 2024 budget. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me go around. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, there was reporting from Japan that the U.S. decided it will not deploy land-based, medium, and intermediate-range um, missiles to Japan. Can you confirm this decision and say what is in their consideration in terms of where the missiles will be deployed? So according to the Department of Defense, there are no plans to deploy capabilities to Japan that range uh, 500, uh, that range beyond 500 kilometers. So I don't have anything uh, more to share. I would refer you to the Department uh, of Defense. Uh, uh, when the uh, President speaks on the economy later this week, uh, how much of that will be talking about his own record and how much will be warning about what Republicans and Congress want to do, such as the sales tax? So just a little bit of what he's going to say. Uh, as I announced last week, for those uh, who may have missed it, uh, on Thursday, President Biden will deliver remarks on the economic progress we have made since he took office. Uh, the President will contrast his plan to build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out, and to protect and strengthen Social Security and Medicare, with the Congressional Republican plan to cut Social Security, Medicare, and other vital programs, and impose a 30 percent national sales tax that will increase taxes on working families. His remarks will, uh, will be in Springfield, Virginia, with union workers who are benefiting from his economic plan. And so we'll have more to share on that tomorrow. Uh, but uh, again, as you as you just heard me lay out, it's going to be a contrast with what we're trying to do and what the what the Republicans have laid out. Uh, but again, the president has always been very clear. He's willing to work in good faith uh, with in a bipartisan way with Republicans to continue to deliver on the economic uh, successes that you've seen from this administration in the last two years. Um, okay. Thank you. Thanks, oh, Kerry. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Karin. I want to ask about, uh, to follow up on the story of Chinese companies uh, providing uh, assistance for Russia. Did you have now a clear sense whether the Chinese government is aware or approving this or not? And my second question is on Turkey, but can you please uh, answer? Oh, can, I'm sorry, can you say your first question again? It's just hard to hear. Yes. About the Chinese companies providing assistance for Russia. Do you have a clear sense whether that Chinese government is aware of that or not? So can't speak to, to that, if the Chinese government is aware of that or not. We're closely monitoring the situation, as I just stated earlier, as we have been uh, since the war started. Uh, and uh, we will continue to communicate to China the, implica the implications of providing uh, material support to Russia's war against Ukraine. Don't have anything specific on what they know or not know, but we're certainly always communicating with them. And on Turkey, yesterday President Erdogan uh, said that Sweden should not expect that uh, Turkey would support Sweden to join NATO over Quran burning. How do you respond to his comment and all, uh, and also to the incident? So I talked about this a little bit yesterday um, about um, what how we see this, uh, and we have said before. Uh, many times before that Finland and Sweden are, are ready to be NATO allies. That's how we see things. Uh, both are, are members of, of NATO's Partnership for Peace and NATO's Enhanced Opportunities Partnership. Their mil militaries work seamlessly uh, with alliances, uh, forces. Finland and Sweden have already taken concrete steps to fulfill the commitments they made under the trilateral memorandum of agreement with Turkey signed on the margins of the NATO summit in Madrid, as you all know. And that includes substantially strengthening their bilateral cooperation with Turkey uh, on key security concerns. We continue to expect that NATO uh, will formally welcome Finland and Sweden as members. This will enhance their security, uh, as well as that of the Euro Alliance uh, region. So as uh, their membership process continues, the United States is fully committed to Finland's and Sweden's accession. Uh, the strength of that support, bless you, uh, can be seen in our Senate's overwhelming bipartisan support for vote for their membership, and that, uh, and so again, that's uh, that's where we stand uh, on that particular matter. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the last several weeks, major IT companies like Google, Microsoft, Amazon have fired thousands of uh, IT professionals. A significant number of them are either Indian Americans or Indian IT professionals. The two questions, these companies are saying that a recession is on the horizon, that's why they are firing these people. Does the president think that there is a recession coming up? 
And secondly, these Indian IT professionals who are on H-1B visa, they have to leave the country in 16 days. These people who have their families and kids standing here, they have house and mortgage, they're asking for more time to stay here so that they can find an alternative way to sustain them. So more broadly, I'm just not going to speculate why companies, uh, individual companies, uh, have made specific personnel decisions, that is for them to speak to. Uh, but, you know, you, uh, you don't have to make, take my word for it. Our economy is continuing to grow in a steady and, and stable manner, as we have, you've heard us from here, uh, and you just have to look at the economic data. When you look at the CPI data, you look at uh, PPI, uh, and, uh, and so more broadly, again, when it comes to economy, layoffs remain near record lows according to job uh, uh, opening data. Uh, again, I'm just not going to get into specifics or why this is happening. Uh, this is something for individual, individual companies uh, to speak to. And, uh, and look, the President has said this many times. He's going to do everything that he can uh, to make sure this is an economy that works for everyone, uh, that works from the, uh, from the bottom up, middle out, and that's what you've seen from his economic plans. But, you know, the President understands firsthand uh, how the impact of losing a job can have on a family. He understands that very personally, uh, but just not going to get into individual specifics. And the status of those who have been fired, uh, how can they stay here in this country? I don't have any specifics on, on, um, on that when it comes to how they can stay here. What I can say is uh, speak more broadly about uh, what we're seeing through the data, uh, what uh, don't want to comment on individual companies. We could, I can speak to what the, how the economy uh, has actually been more of a stable and steady growth uh, because of the president's actions. Go ahead, Laura. Go ahead, Laura. Hi. Um, heading into this meeting with the congressional um, Democratic leaders, is there anything you can tell us about the relationship between President Biden and Leader Jeffries? Obviously, we know his relationship with uh, Speaker Pelosi before, and he goes way back with Schumer, but what kind of relationship, if any, does he have with uh, Congressman Jeffries? The President sees Congressman Jeffries, uh, Leader Jeffries, as a vital partner in this and is looking forward to continuing to uh, to work with the Congressman and, and, and also is proud to work uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the Congressman closely as we, uh, as we uh, push forward on our shared agenda, our shared priorities in the 118th Congress. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.